Hey there, and welcome to the world of Sekiro, my new series of posts and videos dedicated to reading and interpreting Sekiro Shadows Die Twice official artworks, a giant book that I brought with me from Japan in 2019, before I even played the game. I hope to make smaller posts and videos about a handful of items or characters at a time, so they're not tiring to watch or read and, honestly, to write and edit. There will be a lot of posts and videos and then probably a lot of touch-ups as I learn more and more about the world of Sekiro as it was created, so you'll be seeing this work in progress for quite some time. Of course, you can wait a year or two until I finish everything, but I would be delighted to have your company on this journey as it goes on. Sekiro is one of my most favorite games of all time. I love it with all my heart. I know that many people think that I'm a Soulsborne pro because I wrote such lengthy posts about those games, but the shocking truth is that I've never actually completed any of them. The lore always enchanted me much more than the gameplay, so I didn't feel the need to actually play through the Soulsborne games to immerse myself into the world. Dark Souls 2 was my first game of the franchise, I played about half of it, then I started Dark Souls 1 and played even less. I haven't touched Dark Souls 3 and I have never owned a PlayStation and consequently haven't played any Bloodborne. Quite frankly, I always found Soulsborne games very scary to play, so I watched passionate people who really enjoyed the process, and I, in turn, enjoyed the lore, the world building, and everything I was truly interested in. Sekiro turned out to be quite different, as if it was made for me. I enjoy everything about it. The game was quite challenging for me and required a lot of effort on my part, but I am happy, and a little proud, to have completed it successfully. Now I get to relish the subsequent playthroughs and hunt the tiny details that I might have missed my first time around. I slightly adjusted the disclaimers because I'm quite tired of just copy-pasting them, but as the evidence shows, they're still necessary. Number one, common sense is still everything. Please do not assume that I have access to some secret true knowledge. I am just entertained by reading Sekiro in Japanese. My law theories are just theories, so treat them accordingly. Number two, I am not a professional translator, I have never worked in localization. Yes, I will say that something is translated poorly and something is not, and it will be my personal point of view. People have been complaining that I am picking on minor things, so have weird opinions when it comes to better translations. I want to emphasize that it's okay to have those. Ultimately, my goal is to give you the information so you can see if the localization was good or not, whether something important was lost or not. My opinion is just that, and I choose to share it, however odd it might seem. Number three, I am not an expert on Buddhism, so if I get something wrong in the religious side of things, I'm sorry. From Software had a theological consultant who helped them build the religious narrative in Sekiro. I will leave links to the Buddhist terms that we will undoubtedly encounter so you can read more on your own if you're interested. As usual, the transcriptions I give do not follow all academic rules, and I don't think it's necessary. They're just here to represent the pronunciation in case you're curious. All sources I used for this research will be listed in the description box below, along with all the additional information that I've referenced throughout the video so you can read more if you're interested. There you will also find a link to my original blog post if you want to read it through. The structure of these videos will be different from my previous Lost in Translation videos. We'll take a look at the in-game description of the item and then compare it to its Japanese original. If I don't mention something, it means the localization got it right and there is nothing to discuss. I'll include some in-game footage where relevant, and I will also include the Japanese text so that if you speak the language you can double-check things or learn something new. Nothing is quite as exciting as learning a new kanji or two. It was quite difficult to stay in line and dedicate this research to Sugars, Spirit Falls and the Headless only. When we speak of Sugars, we inevitably touch on the religious organizations inside the world of Sekiro, Senpo Temple and Mount Misen, where the shinobi hunters are trained. One thing clings to another and boom, we have to talk about Senpo monks, enemies of Mount Congo, martial arts, the quest for immortality, temple spies, and talk about everything there is to talk about in Sekiro. I always have to remind myself not to get too carried away and keep these videos smaller and easier to parse. If you've played Sekiro, you know that sugars are consumable items that you can find in the world, buy from merchants or loot from enemies. Only one sugar can be active at a time. As soon as you consume another one, the new benefits override the previous sugar effects. After you defeat optional bosses, the Headless, you get a Spirit Fall, an infinite version of one of the sugars that you can use to your heart's content as long as you have the Spirit Emblems. 
so let's talk about sugars. All sugars have the same description structure, so many phrases like sustaining X blessing and bite the candy and take the X stands to impart it in human benediction are exactly the same both in the original and in the localized version. We won't discuss them every time, just once. I must say I absolutely adore the sugar translation, it sounds great. In Japanese these items are called ame, it means hard candy. The names of almost all sugars also follow the same pattern. The first kanji usually denotes some Buddhist term, and the second kanji explains what the sugar does. It's very interesting to uncover. For example, in Akko, the first kanji A denotes the first Sanskrit alphabet letter that symbolizes the source of all things in esoteric Buddhism. It is also the first part of Om, a sacred sound and a symbol in Hinduism and Buddhism. The second kanji Ko usually denotes aggression, assault, for example, there is a verb Semeru, with this kanji, meaning to attack. The localized version stays true to the original when it says that the sugars, except for one, are made in Sempo temple. Sustaining X blessing corresponds to the original, literally, candy that has received the divine protection of spirit's name, which I find curious. The effect of Akko's sugar is presented in most generic words, boosts attack power, when the original goes into more detail, boosts vitality and posture damage. The funniest thing I found in the standard description of all sugars is the word kamishime, which means bite down with force. The English localization came up with an amazing translation bite down hard, but somehow lost it along the way so it is present only in Akko's description. That's too bad, this little detail was so well done. Now we need to understand what it is that Wolf gets by taking a spirit stance. English localization says that he receives inhuman benediction, which is not entirely accurate. The original says literally, the divine protection of the inhuman spirit is brought upon you. In Japanese it sounds kind of menacing, like you invoke this inhuman spirit and let it into you, which is not necessarily a good thing. All the aforementioned pertains to all sugars, they all have these elements in their descriptions. Now let's see what Akko's own description says. So, the spirits embody acts as karma. I am not an expert on karmic terms, but I don't think that the original actually mentions karma as it is. Here is the whole line. Let's dissect it. Mitama Oroshi is basically the acceptance or the fact of invoking the spirit who blessed the sugar. The original says that Miwaza, the works of the gods or spirits, may turn out to be too much for a human body, so you'll have to carry this burden when you consume the sugar. I understand that the word Miwaza might throw people off scent, since the second kanji, when read as Go, means karma, but here it is a part of a pretty specific word. So, when biting down hard on this candy, be ready that your human body might not be enough and you'll be struggling. In Ungo, the first kanji Un is the second part of Aun, where A is the first kanji from Akko. Aun represents the primordial trinity of Vishnu, Shiva and Brahma. It's alpha and omega, beginning and end. This duality has its place in the sugars too. Akko is a sugar for attack, and Ungo is a sugar for protection. The second kanji Go means protection. The rest of the description, including the part about the access karma, is identical to Akko's. The last line, however, is unique to Ungo's sugar. Senpo monks spread this candy across Ashina in honor of her military heroes. Senpo monks spread this candy across Ashina in honor of Gokoku no Yusha, heroes defenders of the country. That's what the headless were called when they're still alive, heroes defending their country. Gokan is another precious case of name construction. Go generally denotes something sturdy, indestructible. In Buddhism, it is used, for example, in the word Kongo, meaning Vajra, a ritual weapon that symbolizes indestructibility and irresistible force. The article I linked to even mentions Gokori, a five-pronged bell, the very same item that allows Wolf to enter the Hall of Illusions. It is also a ritual object, like Vajra, and we'll talk about it in more detail when we get to folder screen monkeys in later videos. The second kanji is Kan. It is used in the original word for posture. The name of this sugar is essentially unbreakable posture, which is quite logical since it reduces posture damage. Gokan sugar is the only sugar that is not manufactured in Senpo Temple. The original says that this sugar is made by shinobi hunters of Misen. 
The curious thing is that it isn't called Misen Temple, it's called Misen In, something like Organization Misen. Here I need to mention that Misen is a real place. It's the highest mountain on the Miyajima Island. Misen is a sacred mountain. It has been a place of pilgrimage for religious visitors since the ancient times. The mountain has its own seven wonders, seven wonders of Misen. Interestingly enough, many of these wonders are big ancient trees, and the forest itself is gigantic and extremely old. Funny that in Sekiro, the sugar that reduces posture damage is made on Mount Misen, because the kanji kan in Gokan actually denotes a tree trunk. The original also mentions that shinobi hunters of Misen do not only make these sugars, they also sell them wholesale. English localization did a great job translating the unique line of this sugar. Well versed in the art of killing shinobi echoes the original very accurately. I will continue to refer to shinobi hunters as people from the Misen organization, fully and painfully realizing how stupid it sounds, but in Japanese Misen just isn't written as a temple and it's probably an important thing. Gatin is my favorite sugar, I used it more than any other. It took me quite some time to comprehend why my beloved kanji tsuki here uh, takes a weird and atypical reading gachi. There is another word that has this kanji with gachi reading, gachirin, full moon or round moon. Just look at the picture of this sugar, there is a moon circle there, so that's probably why. Gachin sugar is the only sugar without a Buddhist reference, or maybe I just haven't found one. Probably because it's an odd one out. Gashin sugar does not in any way impact your vitality, attack power or posture, contrary to all other sugars. I find it hilarious that the localization calls the little guys assassins, when the original says rappa, thug, hooligan or spy. Short but adept is also just a localization fantasy. The Japanese version does not have any of those descriptions. It says that the high priests gave the sugar to the spies, but denoting the high priest, the original uses the word shonin. It's not in any way remarkable, it just means someone of high rank. This is also the only sugar where take the stance part is written a little bit differently, but I can't quite catch the difference in meaning if there is one. Quite possibly this changes again due to the fact that gachin sugar is not a combat sugar, so you take the stance without this boo spirit powers pay the price stuff. Maybe I'm wrong, this detail seems a little odd to me anyway. Do Senpo's dirty work sounds rather humiliating. In reality, spies do ura no shigoto, hidden deeds that do not need publicity. Ura means reverse side, side hidden from view. Once hired guards is very disappointing. The original states quite clearly that the spies were once shinobi protecting the temple. Now they're helping monks in their quest for undeath. But it's important to know that the monks do not seek immortality, they already have it. From the texts written by high priests, we learn that they just want to know why they were given this immortality and for what purpose, where the centipedes come from and what it all means. That's why they try to artificially make a dragon heir to get closer to understanding their unending life. I think we can assume quite safely that these spies were the ones who kidnapped children for their experiments, and it was that Ura no Shigoto, a secret undertaking occurring on the other side of Senpo Temple. Yashariku is a remarkable word, made me really happy. Yasha means yaksha, a class of nature spirits, usually benevolent but not necessarily. In Buddhism, yakshas are the attendants of Vaisravana, one of the four heavenly kings known in Japan as Bishamonten. Riku is an archaic kanji present in the verb rikusu, to murder. The effect of the sugar is quite simple, only the original does not say that it halves the vitality and posture, it says lowers considerably, but I think the candy actually halves the parameters, so this is not a big deal at all. It was indeed forbidden in the temple, however the undying research was draining their finances, literally ate money, as the original says. That is why Yashariku sugar was distributed far and wide in exchange for donations. The English localization unfortunately missed the little but important phrase jigai ni mo, and beyond the temple too, which implies that you could get these sugars in the temple as well for a suitable price. If you look closely, you'll see that in battle, Senpo monks use all combat sugars, ako, ungo, and gokan, but not yashariku. On the other hand, ministry agents like Masanaga boys do seem to have them on hand. 
Thus, we can assume that the ministry donated quite a lot of money to Sempo Temple in exchange for these sugars. And that's about all there is to discuss about sugars. Oh, and one more thing. When you consume a sugar, the kanji that flash above wolf's head are just the name of the sugar. So let's see what we've learned. All sugars, except for Gachin sugar, are connected to Buddhist religious terms or spirits. The sugars receive divine protection of the corresponding spirit. By biting down hard on the sugar, you let the spirit into yourself, invoke it. The deeds of Akko spirit might prove to be too much for a human body to endure, and there might be a high price to pay. Ungo sugars were distributed by Senpo monks in honor of the heroes defenders of the country, the headless. Gokan sugars are made by shinobi hunters of Misen and then sold wholesale. Senpo assassins are in reality former shinobi who protected the temple. Now they are spies helping the monks in their quest for undeath. Gachin sugars were given to the spies by high priests. Yashariku sugar is forbidden in the Senpo temple, however you can get it both there and outside of the temple in exchange for donations. Spirit falls are special items that you get after defeating the headless. There are five spirit falls in total. With the spirit fall you can summon the spirit of the corresponding sugar in exchange for spirit emblems. Spirit fall descriptions give us lore about the headless. In Japanese they are called kubinashi, literally headless. The fact that kubi actually means neck and not head, and yet it is often used as head, usually turns many localizations into a mess. English localization correctly translated headless, but failed miserably with headless ape dialogue. Remember the bloody guy sitting on the ground as you go to the headless ape arena? He's moaning in pain, saying, my neck, my neck. I thought the poor guy broke his neck having been pushed aside by the giant raging ape, but then I realized that in Japanese he's talking about kubi. <laughs> like a headless ape just passed here. If you have ever been grabbed by a headless and you are not sure what happened there apart from a lot of pain, the headless actually extract wolf's Shirikodama. Shirikodama is a mythical bowl containing one's soul and located inside the anus. In Japanese mythology, kappas are usually the ones to hunt for Shirikodama, but apparently the headless are also willing to participate. Maybe they just want your soul. Just as sugars, all spirit falls have the same description structure where most powers are exactly the same. The original word for spirit fall is mitamoroshi, meaning acceptance of the spirit or invoking, liberating the spirit. It is actually quite a dangerous endeavor, you literally summon the spirit to possess you. Spirit fall is an awesome translation, I think it's very accurate. You summon the spirit and it falls upon you. One of the theories suggests that the headless actually are Akko, Ungo, Gokan, Gachin and Yashiriku themselves. The localization leads you to believe as much. However, it always seemed odd to me that the godlike spirits were beheaded across Ashina and thrown into the canals, caves or whatever wilderness in their undergarments. The first line of any description in Sekiro always answers the question, what is this item? A spirit fall is literally a remnant of the spirit of the headless who has accepted spirit name. This seems to be more plausible. The five warriors of Ashina, while they were alive, Invoked powerful spirits, became heroes defenders of the land, but then something went wrong and they were all beheaded. They probably couldn't simply die because of their connection to the spirits, that's why they turned into the monsters we now know as the Headless. After killing them for good, Wolf receives a part of their soul that still preserves the connection to the spirit they summoned when they were alive. Thus, using the scrap of their being, Wolf can also invoke the spirit in exchange for some spirit emblems. I'm not sure how Sempo and the Sugar Factory fits into the picture yet. I hope to learn more as we go deeper into the lore of monks and Sempo Temple in later videos. But I assume that monks made the sugar themselves, but spread them in honor of the heroes as a marketing campaign. Eat our sugars and you will be, temporarily, like our greatest heroes. They had to get money for their research from somewhere. The mechanics of the spirit fall are translated accurately. You can use this item however many times spending katashiro, spirit emblems. Katashiro is a very real thing. It is a Shinto item used in certain purification rituals or as a representative of sacred objects or even a person. If you are familiar with Natsumi Yujincho, you've seen katashiro multiple times. The original says that the headless are what remains of the heroes who took the wrong path for the sake of defending their country. 
the phrase shadows of their former selves is used. Curious that this wrong path was quite possibly the summoning of the spirits into their bodies, the headless wanted to protect their country and became vessels for powerful spirits to use their strength for this purpose, but it all ended tragically. Seize the power of an inhuman spirit by laying it to rest. Not sure where this came from, the original does not have this line or anything like it. The last line specific to Akko's spirit wall says that by accepting the inhuman spirit, you will gain power, but if nothing in return is offered, in the end you'll go mad. You know the aggressive theme of Akko when you get a lot of power but risk losing your mind because of that? There is only one line in Ungo's description that is different. It's the last one that tells us about the Ungo headless. English localization chose to embellish quite terse Japanese description with things like swift beheading and lifeless body to amp up the drama. Find it kind of funny. The gist is still there, though. The warrior lost his mind defending his country and was beheaded for the attempted mutiny. His body was thrown into the canal, where we later find him. In Gokan's description, the first sentence is quite confusing and difficult to decipher. The line is very short. Here it is. Kubizuka is a wonderful word that denotes a burial mound for severed heads. Yes, there is a dedicated word for this in Japanese. Shizume means to appease, to calm, to suppress. If you remember where exactly we find the Gokan headless, it all becomes quite clear. From the first Sunken Valley idol, you go back along the cliffside, and then you find several pyramid-shaped burial mounds. Now we know that there are severed heads inside those mounds. If you go underwater and then to the cave where the headless dwells, you can find these pyramids there too. Judging by the description, these are calming burial mounds. Probably people of Ashina wanted to calm their dangerous neighbor by offering him a wide assortment of heads since he does not have his own. The verb mairu also has a meaning to visit shrine or grave, thus the description tells us that despite the fact that there are burial mounds for calming the evil spirit, it's been a long time since someone visited them. This verb has a lot of meanings and I might be mistaken, but this is how I understand this description as of now. It is a very lonely place and no one comes here to visit the graves of the deceased. This description honestly makes me really sad. In Gachin's description, the phrase falling to pieces sounds kind of suspicious and weird. The original uses the same word we've seen over and over again in Sugar and Spirit Falls, guru, to lose one's mind, to go mad. Interestingly enough, the pronoun I used by the headless in the description, the last phrase is direct speech, is onore, archaic and humble version of I. I am going mad will be the more literal translation. Probably the warrior expected such fate, or maybe the insanity caused by the only non-combat spirit fall comes slower, I don't know. Said the man to himself is a very curious part. In Japanese it's soro o satori, where satori does not only refer to some kind of realization or understanding, but is also a Buddhist term. Satori is a term for awakening, a deep experience of seeing into one's true nature. I think it has its place in the lore of the Gachin Headless. The localization also skipped the part that says that the man disappeared in the forest all alone. Maybe he realized that he was going mad and thus chose to venture into the deep forest all on his own. How did he lose his head, though? In Yashariku's Spirit Falls description, lost in utero is more like an assumption. The original text doesn't say it outright. It says, this hero must have been born one of the twins. We actually don't know what happened to the other twin, probably something like lost in utero, but again, we don't know for sure. The second part is translated mostly correctly. The original says something like, if there were two of them, it would be impossible to think that they could be defeated by the palace nobles. I don't know where his head is. I don't think the nobles beheaded him. They most likely just killed him with the horrible sound of their stupid flutes. Just kidding, but it's really hard for me to imagine they would actually behead him. And I also have no clue where his ghost twin's head went. I don't think he was ever even alive. So let's sum up new things we learned about the spirit falls. It is basically the process of summoning a spirit into one's body. The item itself is a piece of the headless's soul that preserved the connection with the spirit that the warrior summoned when he was alive. 
Burial mounds near Gokan Headless contained severed heads to appease or calm him. Gushin Headless realized he was going insane and then went alone into the deep forest. It is also important to mention that beheading was a widespread form of punishment in Japan. Usually it was the second step of seppuku. As soon as the convicted plunged a blade into their stomach, they were beheaded by kashakunin, a skilled swordsman. Decapitation in this ritual was a form of art, since the swordsman always left a slight band of flesh so the head wouldn't roll around and the blood wouldn't splatter all over the place and disturb the viewers. However, decapitation without seppuku, without disembowelment, was considered to be the most severe and humiliating punishment for exceptional wrongdoings. It is especially true for the Sengoku period when Sekiro takes place. The headless do not have any wounds in their stomachs. They were just beheaded. The weapon of the headless, Nodachi, extra long sword, also points at their physical prowess. Nodachi swords were so long and heavy that most people couldn't wield them. Soldiers carried Nodachi in hand because a normal human wouldn't have the arm length to pull it from the sheath on the back. Nodachi swords were used against cavalry to kill horses. The headless, however, do not seem to have any trouble wielding Nodachi and flex the sword with confidence. Sometimes it is hard to comprehend all the tiny nuances, but Sekiro is so beautiful in Japanese, I can't wait to read more. Next posts and videos will be dedicated to bosses and their associated items like Lady Butterfly and her kunai, or Gyobu and his broken horn. I hope I will be able to consistently make a video version for each of these posts so you can subscribe to the channel to be immediately notified when something new is released. This will be a long and interesting journey and I'm glad to have your company. Don't forget to check the description for relevant links and more reading. Thank you very much for your time and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.